Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear students. Today we shall be taking up Packing by Jerome K. Jerome. This has been taken from your NCRT textbook in English, Beehive. Well, this is Jerome K. Jerome. He was an English writer and humorist. And he is best known for his comic travelogue, that is Three Men in a Boat. The excerpt that you are going to read in a short while packing has been taken from this book only. Uh, this is a travelogue. Basically, what is a travelogue? You should know. Travelogue refers to a book or film about places that are visited or experienced by a traveler. Packing Children is an extract from Three Men in a Boat, which has been written by Jerome K. Jerome. And it is a humorous extract about the confusion and mess that is created by people who are inexperienced in the art of packing. This excerpt exposes the utter clumsiness of the three friends, that is Jerome, George and Harris. And they think that they are all skilled in the art of packing. However, when you read the excerpt, you'll realize the reality is quite opposite. I rather pride myself on my packing. Packing is one of those many things that I feel I know more about than any other person living. It surprises me myself sometimes how many such things there are. I impressed the fact upon George and Harris and told them that they had better leave the whole matter entirely to me. Now who's this I here? I refers to Jerome himself, the narrator. They fell into the suggestion with a readiness that had something uncanny about it. George spread himself over the easy chair and Harris cocked his legs on the table. Now you can visualize this that both the other friends that is George and Harris are not willing to help the narrator in any kind of packing here. Okay. This was hardly what I intended. Well, this was certainly not the intention of the narrator. What I had meant, of course, was that I should boss the job and that Harris and George should potter about under my directions. I pushing them aside every now and then with, oh, you, here, let me do it. There you are, simple enough, really teaching them, as you might say. They're taking it in the way they did, irritated me. There is nothing does irritate me more than seeing other people sitting about doing nothing when I'm working. So the author, the narrator is quite upset about the way his friends are behaving. I lived with a man once who used to make me mad that way. He would loll on the sofa and watch me doing things by the hour together. He said it did him real good to look on at me messing about. Now I'm not like that. I can't sit still and see another man slaving and working. I want to get up and superintend and walk round with my hands in my pockets and tell him what to do. It is my energetic nature, you see. I can't help it. However, I did not say anything, but I started the packing. It seemed a longer job than I had thought it was going to be. But I got the bag finished at last and I sat on it and strapped it. Aren't you going to put the boots in, said Harris. And I looked round and found I had forgotten them. That's just like Harris. He couldn't have said a word until I'd got the bag shut and strapped, of course. And George laughed. One of those irritating, senseless laughs of his. They do make me so wild. I opened the bag and packed the boots in. And then just as I was going to close it, a horrible idea occurred to me. Had I packed my toothbrush? I don't know how it is, but I never do know whether I have packed my toothbrush. My toothbrush is a thing that haunts me when I'm traveling and makes my life a misery. I dream that I haven't packed it and wake up in a cold perspiration and get out of bed and hunt for it. And in the morning, I pack it before I have used it and have to unpack again to get it. And it is always the last thing I turn out of the bag. And then I repack and forget it and have to rush upstairs for it at the last moment. 
and carry it to the railway station wrapped up in my pocket handkerchief. Can you imagine? Of course, I had to turn every mortal thing out now and of course I could not find it. I rummaged the things up into much the same state. Rummaged is that he is looking for it hurriedly and in a careless manner. So it is, uh, you know, quite possible that he will not find it. So I rummaged the things up into much the same state that they must have been before the world was created and when chaos reigned. So there is a subtle sense of humor here. Of course, I found George and Harris's 18 times over, but I couldn't find my own. I couldn't find my own toothbrush. I found my friend's toothbrush, but I could not find, uh, find my own. I put the things back one by one. I held everything up and shook it. Then I found it inside a boot. I repacked once more. Well, when I had finished, George asked me if the soap was in. I said I didn't care a hang whether the soap was in or whether it wasn't. And I slammed the bag shut and strapped it and found that I had packed my spectacles in it and had to reopen it. It got shut up finally at 10, 5 p.m. And then there remained the hampers to do. Harry said that we should be wanting to start in less than 12 hours, 12 hours time and thought that he and George had better do the rest. I agreed. I sat down and they had a go. Well, they began in a light-hearted spirit, evidently, evidently means clearly, intending to show me how to do it. I made no comment. I only waited. With the exception of George, Harris is the worst packer in this world. And I looked at the piles of plates and cups and kettles and bottles and jars and pies and stoves and cakes and tomatoes etc and felt that the thing would soon become exciting well it did they started with breaking a cup that was the first thing they did they did that just to show show you what you, what they could do and to get you interested then harris packed the strawberry jam on top of a tomato and squashed it and they had to Pick out the tomato with a teaspoon and then it was George's turn and he trod on the butter. It didn't say any, I didn't say anything but I came over and sat on the edge of the table and watched them. It irritated them more than anything I could have said. I felt that it made them nervous and excited and they stepped on things and put things behind them and then couldn't find them when they wanted them and they packed the pies at the bottom and put heavy things on top and smashed the pies in imagine they upset salt over everything and asked for the butter i never saw two men do more than one and two pence worth of butter in my whole life than they did after george had got it off his slipper they tried to put it in the kettle it wouldn't go in and what was in wouldn't come out they did scrape it out at last and put it down on a chair and harris sat on it and it stuck to him and they went looking for it all over the room i'll take my oath i put it down on the chair said george staring at the empty seat i saw you do it myself not a minute ago said harris then they started round the room again looking for it and then they met again in the center and stared at one another most extraordinary thing i ever heard of said george so mysterious said harris then George got round at the back of Harris and saw it. Why, here it is all the time, he exclaimed indignantly. Indignantly is angrily. Where? cried Harris, spinning round. Stand still, can't you? roared George, flying after him. 
and they got it off and packed it in the teapot. Montmorency, now this is the dog, this is their pet dog, was in it all, of course. His ambition in life is to get in the way and be sworn at. Be sworn at here means that uh, he will be scolded for that, okay? If he can squirm in, squirm means children, wriggling or twisting the body. So the author says, if he can squirm in anywhere where he particularly is not wanted and be a perfect nuisance and make people mad and have things thrown at his head, then he feels his day has not been wasted. To get somebody to stumble over him and curse him steadily for an hour is his highest aim and object and when he has succeeded in accomplishing this, his conceit becomes quite unbearable. He came and sat down on things just when they were wanted to be packed and he labored under the fixed belief that whenever Harris or George reached out their hand for anything, it was his cold, damp nose that they wanted. He put his leg into the jam and he worried the teaspoons. Worried the teaspoons means that he is going to, you know, disturb the way they were kept. And he pretended that the lemons were rats and got into the hamper and killed three of them before Harris could land him with the frying pan. Hit him with the frying pan, basically. Harris said, I encouraged him. I didn't encourage him. A dog like that doesn't want any encouragement. It's the natural, original sin that is born in him that makes him do things like that. The packing was done at 12.50 and Harris sat in the big hamper and said he hoped nothing would be found broken. George said that if anything was broken, it was broken, which reflection seemed to comfort him. He also said he was ready for bed. We were all ready for bed. Harris was to sleep with us that night and we went upstairs. We tossed for beds and Harris had to sleep with me. He said, do you prefer the inside or the outside? J, J refers to Jerome. I said, I generally prefer to sleep inside a bed. Harris said, it was all. George said, what time shall I wake you fellows? Harris said, seven. I said, no, six, because I wanted to write some letters. Harris and I had a bit of a row over it, but at last split the difference and said half past six. Wake us at 6.30, George, we said. Now, split the difference here basically means that, uh, you know, they agreed on 6.30 because it was halfway between 6 and 7. George made no answer and we found on going over that he had been asleep for some time. So we placed the bath where we could tumble into it on getting out in the morning and went to bed ourselves. All right, so as far as the extract is concerned, we need to mainly focus on these four characters, Jerome, George, Harris, and the dog, pet dog, Montmorency. Jerome is the narrator of the story, and the events are basically depicted from his point of view. He is an overconfident person, and he rates his packing skills, you know, a bit too high. He's quite arrogant, arrogant and he expects his friends to carry out the tedious part of packing while he sits back and, you know, is able to boss around. His friends, however, do not take him seriously. And Jerome uh, is also clumsy and forgetful. He forgets to pack his, uh, you know, toothbrush. You saw that toothbrush episode, what exactly happened over there. So on the whole, he's an ordinary person, ordinary boy. He ignores the shortcomings of his friends and in the same uh, in the, basically in the same manner as he ignores his own now george and harris are his friends or friends of the narrator you can say jerome both of them are as clumsy ill organized forgetful and casual as their narrator himself okay uh, they you know come uh, repeat their mistakes uh, in spite of making a fool of themselves while packing for the trip they don't believe in any blame game and they ignore each other's mistakes okay uh you know their actions are quite amusing the reader is quite amused especially in that episode of uh, you know uh, where they damage and spoil many things like cups and butter and lemons and uh, at, uh, at the time of packing the hamper okay now let's come to the pet dog the pet dog uh, montmorency uh, is is the pet dog of the three friends jerome george and harris he is quite a pampered pet 
uh, he has not been trained well. His animal instinct to probe everything creates a nuisance for all three friends. Uh, he is quite excited. He likes, uh, you know, to be a part of all the activities that are happening in the house. And he is quite excited when these friends are packing. He is quite energetic and uh, not trained well though. Uh, he is temperamental, uh, destructive, but at the same time he is quite loved by uh, the friends, by all three friends, okay? So this was uh, in case you have to write a character sketch in your exams, this is what it is. Now finally we come to the final take, you can call it a theme, you can call it a message. Uh, the final take on the on the extract anything so it is basically based on the theme that routine tasks are not as easy as they seem to be and the humorous account amuses the readers with the chaotic and confusing situations that are created by the clumsiness of the three characters okay and uh, the author has depicted everything in a humorous manner it is also an eye-opener for those who take packing lightly because it is a serious affair and in case you plan to take your pet on a trip the author conveys a message that it should be well trained all right that's all for now i hope you enjoyed and understood each and everything thank you for watching